We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Madi. And on today's episode of The Spicy Life, we are covering why our men need to heal um, such a priority right now. And to join me in the G spot, that is guest spotlight, I have Dr. Corey Emanuel, who is a media psychologist dedicated to shedding light on the intersection of mass media perceptions and learned behaviors. So can I get a round of applause for yeah, Corey? Yeah. Yeah, I've had you on this show before. Happening. Glad to, to be back. Had to bring you back. I'm glad um, to be back. You have a lot of fans out there, but let me tell you, my mom is probably your biggest one. And I am your mom's biggest <laughs> fan too. Like she's always giving me feedback. I'm like, you know what? If I only help one person today, she she is she is my go-to. I love it. Uh, please tell me this. She's not telling you. You know, you should add this to your uh to she your She has page. it, but I will okay. welcome it because I feel like she has a great <laughs> pulse. You know, she knows the pulse of what's happening. I love it. She actually suggested to me a couple weeks ago that I should do healing. And I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. I know just the person in mind. Love um, it. so she'll be happy that I'm covering <laughs> how to heal in order to get, you know, close for love yeah. um and be super excited to have you. So I've done the spicy um the um like G spot with you before where mm -hmm. I warmed you up. Um, based on SPICY. So I don't need to ask you like again when you fell in love with yourself. Instead, we're going to do the spicy dish, okay. which is also like your area of expertise. Yeah. Um, and just from what I'm noticing with like a lot of the women who come to me needing healing from like relationships that they've been in with men, um, this is something that is particular with even like we see in entertainment is, you know, these men kind of um, going a little, you know, getting a little wild when it comes to uh, being able to self-regulate their behaviors around relationships and love. Um, so that's why I wanted us to do like, okay, what healing work needs to be done um, for the entire male population, but uh, in particular, our community. So um, the three that like came to mind as far as like people who've been in the media that have been crazy in love are like Kanye, Offset because he'd be doing some crazy stuff for Cardi. And then the baby, what we've seen with him and um Danny Lee. Yeah. So um kind of wanted to hear your feedback on like these men in particular, right? Why do when it comes to relationship or even with um men, why are they not doing the work? Why aren't these men getting the help that they need and they're letting it kind of create these like toxic relationships? Yeah, I think it's probably great to start with Kanye. And the reason I say Kanye, Kanye's life has been on display probably the longest. Yep. And even with his new Netflix docuseries, we're getting an even more intimate look in his life. So I think, as I often say, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm, I'm a psychologist and I have expertise in mental health. Um, and so he's, he's a really great person to just sort of take a look back. I think he invites us in in a way uh, to look at a lot of men. Um, so I, again, let's just start with him. So I think the most obvious sort of challenge Kanye's facing right now is one of an emotional absence uh, left by his mom. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've seen that come out in many different ways. Um, she passed away 15 years ago. Um, so that's a long time when you're a celebrity to be in the spotlight and be dealing with trauma. You know, that that is yeah. absolutely considered, you know, a traumatic experience to lose someone that you love and that you adore that is considered your best friend. Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways, it could be argued that's how him and Kim bonded. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Kim lost her dad, yep. you know, and so that that was another wound. And I think that they were able to sort of bond under that wound. Um, and I think for Kanye, he might have believed that having Kim, having this large family could somehow fill that wound. Yep. And so I think the efforting that we see in such a grandiose way is Kanye gaining or trying to have control over a situation, which is the contrast to not having any control over losing his mm. mom. And so I think that there's a lot of efforting happening around, uh, you know, trying to restore or, or uh, build a sense of family because he feel like, feels like he doesn't have that anymore. Um, so I think that that is what I see most with him. I yeah. think obviously he would have to go into therapy and we unpack a <laughs> lot of the other things, you know, but that creative genius is only going to sustain you um, for, for so long. 
Um, and so he's, he's, he's definitely a candidate for a lot of healing work to really unpack all of the layers that that's going on with him. Ooh, and I can't wait until we get into the, like the how, the what, the why, um, that's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Um, offsetting Cardi, yeah. like, mind you, I love me some Cardi. <laughs> me too. I, I love me some Cardi. Stuff, trying to overcompensate with like roses and gifts, like. Look, if a man's going to do you shady, um, he got a great way of making a... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, they've had they've had somewhat of a, a tumultuous relationship, right? Like they break up, they get back together, yep. that type of thing. Um, I think in, in the most recent news, I saw them getting the tattoos for, yep. for Valentine's. I don't know if you saw that. And yeah. I think... You know, that, that again, can speak to the, the larger audience. Um, couples do that. They've been doing that for ages. Uh, but I think the, the thing you have to sort of look at about that is when you have a tattoo of someone, that's, that's not necessarily symbolic of a lasting commitment. Mm -hmm. Like just because you get someone's name tattooed on you doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stay together forever. Um, and I think most psychologists, therapists would ask you, if you say you want to do this, I want to get this person's name tattooed on me. They're yeah. going to ask you, well, why do you want to get that person's name tattooed on you? And I think that's when you can sort, sort start to reveal where the true intentions are, where the true motives are for love in general, mm -hmm. right? This, this is one person that you might be building a relationship with or have a relationship with. But I think pausing to ask yourself why you want to get this person's tattoo you know name tattooed on you which is such a like you're putting it on your body that's that's going to be there forever unless yeah. you were to change it why is it that you want this person's tattoo what is that supposed to symbolically represent for you and that other person what is it what does it mean for you in through the lens of love to have a tattoo because it could be some there could be a bigger thing going on there could be, again, going back to the wound that needs to be filled, you know, could be an abandonment wound. Maybe someone mm. left in childhood or another relationship has left and now you feel like somehow maybe the tattoo is going to be the lasting sort of symbol that this person won't won't leave me. Right. So that, that's sort of my take on what's Or sometimes they have another kid. kid. I mean, they are they do have another kid on the way. Sometimes we use children as a way to like you know, it'll give us another family member, something else to love, to devote our energy mm -hmm. to. It's a testament mm -hmm. to how dedicated we are. We're going to continue to expand. Sometimes you see it in that way too. Absolutely. You so, know, and I think- I love I think, them though. Yeah, really. <laughs> like, I love yeah, I them do though. too. I, I like... hope they, I am rooting for them. <laughs> you know, if they really love each other. You know, now they have kids. I, I really hope that that they can make it work, but they they poss possibly need to do some counseling and, and, For sure. and unpack some things themselves. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, we need to we yeah. need to slide through their DMs and talk about some um, uh, sessions that we want to set up for them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then, then the, the last, last one. one. Yes. The baby and Danny yeah. Lee. Okay. The baby and Danny Lee. That was like yeah. very public all over um, their IG story of like him kicking her out at one point in order to um, have another chick coming over. But she was... Uh, yeah had just had the baby so I think she was like even in the middle of nursing when he's like telling her to get out and they've just had a back and forth then he winds up like uh jump in her brother I mean this is like a, a crazy ass like family dynamic because that's what they are now a family right. but when we see these behaviors from him I'm like okay that boy needs sailing like this is not just uh, this you know it I don't care what she did the way that he's behaving yeah. it's, it's something yeah. within within him Right. And I think, you know, one of the things that I see and, I, you know, we, we're talking about celebrities, but I feel like so much of what they sort of exhibit and display mm -hmm. happens in our relationships to us normal people. It's just theirs is on bigger display. Right. Yep. And so I think there is there is definitely a theme of jumping from one relationship to the next before doing any healing work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that is particularly what I see uh, with the with the, ba the baby and Danny Lee. I, I don't know, you know, with the baby mama from the past, right? Mm -hmm. Had you really done the work there to be free to be able to date someone else, yeah. right? Because there seemed to be a lot of sort of overlap there in terms of closeness. And so I think that that is always a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, I, sure. I personally remember that 
uh, with my own parents when they were going through their divorce and then my dad started dating and trying to move on. But my stepmom could kind of see that my dad wasn't completely over my mom. Mm -hmm. It's just a recipe for a disaster, right? Mm -hmm. So I, my biggest piece of advice for them, you know, obviously they have kids involved, just like Cardi being offset to first and foremost, make sure that you're creating a safe, non-toxic, non-dysfunctional environment for them to grow up in because we've got to think about the adult relationships that they're going to have as X, well, right? X. And then obviously you do the self-work that you need to do individually. Whether or not you guys decide to stay together or try to make it work or not, this particular relationship dynamic has brought some things to the surface. You know, even if it's just anger management, maybe there's an anger management thing that that you need to work yep. on, right? But I, I think it definitely reveals some 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 wounds. My um, newborn just posted on his IG at Prince and Shay um, that stay, <laughs> parents staying in a toxic relationship is just as bad as like you know, is even worse than a single being a single parent, right? Like seeing your your parents Absolutely. in an unhealthy dynamic is worse than seeing your parent by themselves, like at least doing the healing work, and moving on. So um, yes, right. uh, Prince and posted that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Account and I, I talk about that a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, I talk about that a lot too. You know, our parents are our first and perhaps greatest, most comprehensive role model. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're displaying attitudes, behaviors, how they deal with their their mental health. You know, where uh, the first sort of signs of emotional intelligence. Yep. We all see that through our parents. So if that foundation is rocky it really makes adult relationships really, really hard. And it makes the relationship with yourself really hard. That part, exactly. So I wanna dumb this conversation down for people who are like, okay, okay, we hear about like all this healing, but like, what does that really mean? So for people who are still beginning or you know, maybe they've been in their healing journey, I wanna break it down to like, what is healing? We're just gonna start with like the basics. What is yeah, so healing? I I have a very, very simple definition um, that is healing is an ongoing process to transform pain into something useful. Mm. I'll say that again. Healing is an ongoing process to transform pain into something useful. One more right? again for the people because, in the back. <laughs> one, more, one more time. <laughs> healing. healing is an ongoing process to transform pain into something useful. And I put emphasis on ongoing because yeah. there is no sort of like, all right, I'm going to go to therapy for a year and mm -hmm. boom, I am my healed self. I'm whole and I'm ready to take on the world. No, because as we already sort of touched on, there are going to be acute traumas yep. always happening around you. It might be in your own relationship. You might lose a parent. You might lose a job. You're constantly dealing with traumas that you have to heal from. So it is very much an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. And I say transform it into something useful because we can't go back and change, you know, childhood abuse. We can't go back and change that, that domestic abuse, that, that, that physical violence that we dealt with in that last relationship, mm -hmm. but we can try our best through healing to transform it into something useful. Oh my gosh. Um, you're hitting on the money in my, um, spicy life program. One of the things that I teach are the universal laws. One of the universal laws is law of relativity, which is you will be um, put through a series of tests throughout your life and how you handle those tests um, and recover from the grief, from the pain, from the challenges that are thrown your way determines the outcome of your success. And so like, if we don't stop after each thing, you know, and process and heal, um, it continues to snowball and absolutely comes with you to the next relationship, to the next experience, to the next thing. And then like, you know, five relationships later or, you know, um, five friendships lost or whatever, you know, you're dealing with, you you look up and you're like, well, damn, I didn't know it was this thing from 10 years ago that's still affecting me. Yeah. And now, oh, now I'm these going. traumas and these wounds have stacked. Yep. Right. Yep. Make, making it you know, still very much something that you can approach. And I encourage people to uh, approach a healing journey around that. But to your point, when you can get in there as those traumas are happening and begin to do the work, it does seem to be something that you can feel is more manageable mm -hmm. and not so overwhelming mm -hmm. as part of your healing journey. That yeah. part. Um, yeah. Yes, for the, man yeah. <laughs> the management right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, going back to your original question too, you know, about just 
men in this space, right? Yeah. How do they begin this journey? I think we, I think we may have talked about this on our last podcast, but I think it is very important for parents listening right now to mm-hmm. this conversation to be very cognizant about how they talk to their little boys. Mm. And I know we, we hear the example so much growing up of, we tell, you know, little boys, you know, boys don't cry. Mm. You know, you know, we, little, you know, little boys, you got to toughen up. You, you got to be a man. We, yep. we start instilling those messages in, into them very early, which creates a lack of vulnerability yep. and intimacy in growing up. So I don't want to tell my therapist what's going on. I don't mm-hmm. want to tell my, my, my wife, my partner what's happening because I've been conditioned to keep it to myself. Yep. Don't display emotion. So I yep. think the biggest thing we can do as a community is start with our kids Mm -hmm. and letting them practice emotional vulnerability. You know, let them see what emotional regulation looks like with you and your partner as you get into, you know, disagreements and arguments. Let them to a a degree that is developmentally appropriate. (laughs) See how you work through those things mm-hmm. right what what does it look like to do repair work right I think we can resolution. start doing those things absolutely start doing those things very early yeah I think that that is absolutely um imperative and when it comes to you know your children working through you know their own problem solving ability like if they can mirror your behavior which that's what they tend to do you know even if it's something small like they spilt their sippy cup now you know they're able to say like okay well this isn't that bad because you know when my parents have x y and z problem i see them work through it so i can figure out a plan to work through this it's going to be replaced like they can start to (laughs) reason more um and emotionally regulate like you said i absolutely think that that's so important so that's a great start when it comes to um, us being in relationship or even friendship, what are signs that either you as a person need to heal or that your partner needs to heal? Like, what are the telltale signs of what someone is doing that like, uh oh, I either need to run or like (laughs) help you get some help? Absolutely. So I, I would say there's a few, you know, one is that there are areas of your life that are under disruption. There's some some level of of disruption, dysfunction happening around you. It's unhealthy. Mm. You know, we we see on social media all the time the the red flags, and there's yeah. a million of them. Yep. You know, d- definitely being cognizant of okay, something's off here. This, I, I I may not have always had the 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 best relationships or the quote unquote perfect relationship, mm-hmm. but I know this these examples these displays don't sit right with me on a on a soul level yeah there's something that's causing some dis-ease within me that's clearly a sign um you know your emotions are in turmoil Mm. you know maybe you're not sleeping at night maybe you aren't eating maybe you're overeating um but yeah it's it's wide and varied and it really depends on the person Mm because what what might uh be sort of immediately dis dysfunctional or toxic for me uh, might take another person a few months to to sort of register with that because of their own upbringing, their own childhood and other relationships they've been in. Some things have been normalized, right? Yep. So, but yeah, those are just a few of the ones. You're depressed, you're anxious, you know, your anxiety's through the roof. Um, the, these are all signs that that healing and trauma is- Needs is, to is take prevalent. place. Yeah. Now, when it comes to some of that trauma, um, what are the side effects of not getting it, like not doing it, not healing? Okay. Just give me like, give me a list of like how this affects our lives. So people understand the importance of it. Yeah. Well, well, for sure, you know, long-term depression and anxiety are, are probably the, 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 the signs that we see and that are talked about the most, Mm -hmm. um, in the media. Um, I think again, just this, this constant state of flux, right? Where it, things don't seem to be working, right? Like your, your relationship at home with a partner, with a spouse is going to affect how you show up at work. It's going to mm. show up how you, uh, you show up in other relationships. Yep. You know, if, if, if your best friend is really having a hard time in, in her relationship, that is now going to affect what dinner looks like when the two yep. of you sit down. For you know, sure. Oh my gonna, God. You must know my gonna... friends. <laughs> you must know my friends well. <laughs> Listen, you're going to have to show up now as therapists over, over, over dinner. Yeah. And, you know, so it, it, it's, it, there's this entire spectrum of how it show up, how it shows up, how it can show up and how it affects multiple areas of your life. 
Um, one thing that's extremely important to me is my culture, right? And I think that because I'm um, Black and Mexican, I'm able to attract um, my community to me when it comes to doing the healing work and the growth work that's necessary for healthy relationships. So I see a lot of um, women coming into my practice that are trying to get over things that men have done to them, okay? Um, and that's all men, but because of who my like demo is my um, demographic of who comes to me, I see it a lot within my black and brown, okay? Um, and so I wanna know based on our ancestry, like how has slavery in particular um, affected the black community's ability to form healthy relationships and love and heal? Yeah, so there is, there is a- I know it's a loaded amazing, question. I wanted to touch Yeah, it, it is, but I, it's certainly worth talking about. There is an amazing researcher. Um, her name is Dr. Joyce DeGruy. Um, and she talks a lot about just post-traumatic slave syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that there's intergenerational trauma that's yep. been happening. You, you may have never been on a plantation. You may have never been whipped as a slave, but you are certainly still dealing with the, the repercussions, the consequences, the implications of your ancestors mm -hmm. who were in those situations, right? And so the way that shows up in our relationships, you know, we, if, if we looked at, look at the trajectory of, of slavery and, and Jim Crow, Ku, Ku Klux Klan, and that whole uh, trajectory, um, men were ripped from the homes, mm -hmm. right? You, you were ripped apart from your families. You didn't know when a certain family member was going to come back, if they were going to even come back. Um, so there's the, 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 the loss, the abandonment issues that show up intergenerationally. Um, it's, it's such a laundry list, right? And I think that we, we have sort of moved into this, this era of feeling like, well, you know, that, that was then, that was back then. Now we've got therapy and we have all of these things. Yeah. But that still requires work. Right. Like, you know, there still requires active conversations around these areas, um, be it in romantic relationships or just siblings and grandmothers and, and grandsons having these mm -hmm. conversations because things are repeated often. There are certainly patterns of behavior. Uh, there's, there's disease, there's sickness, there's things that are repeated, but certainly have roots, again, in what our ancestors dealt with a, a really long time ago. And we didn't have um, therapy, like, and it wasn't celebrated, right? Like, we just had to just yeah. deal with what was going on. And, you know, I can vividly Absolutely. hear stories of my grandfather talking about, um, you know, him growing up in Jim Crow and then, you know, his father being a slave. And so, like, his mindset it was still stuck when my father was uh, grandfather was alive. His mindset was still stuck in like that time period, even though we were free mm -hmm. now and you know experiencing different things. He still, when he would talk in you know his story, still travel back to that time and relive mm -hmm. it every single time he was telling a story. Like you could see it, you could feel it energetically. Yeah. And so, just yeah. imagine like you know if if healing was allowed back then. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. what that would do. But I feel like um, based on what you said, um, what's happened to our men, because it wasn't celebrated, because we weren't, you know, we were ripped apart. I feel like a lot of um, men are still getting, you know, with this idea around getting the self-help. I see it a lot with yeah. women. Women um, are my number one clientele. And I love working with my men and when they come to me at the Spicy Life. But what I see if, just from, um, even from other therapists is women yeah. are more proactive when it comes to doing the work and getting the right. healing that they need. Why is right. it that it's so much less men? When it comes to the church, we don't see as many men. When it comes to therapy, we don't see mm -hmm. as much, you know, men. What is that? Yeah, and let's, let's connect the dots, right? Like we're talking about just intergenerational trauma. And I think that if we, if we look back again over the timeline, family first centered around production, productivity, like, uh, you know, couples had lots of kids so that you could produce, mm -hmm. right? So that we could produce a living and survive, right? Then around the 60s or so, we moved more into, okay, let, let me look more at like what this relationship can offer me in terms of affection mm. and just partnership and building life together. And I think still there was this, this, this guise of the men is, is there to provide, yeah. right? And I think where we are now current day is we have to look at and unpack what does it mean to provide, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't just mean bringing home the bacon, so to speak, but- yeah. Are you providing emotional intelligence? Are you providing 
repair work when the relationship is 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 gone awry right like providing is so much more now than what it used to be in terms of mm. okay we've got a roof over your head and, and you've got food to eat and you've got clothes what mental social emotional well-being as men can we bring to our families yeah so that to me that's the shift that has to happen right and the only way to do that is through the vulnerability to say i'm struggling in this area this was an area that I never saw displayed growing up in my home. Mm. But I noticed that I have an awareness around that. And I know that this is a deficiency. Mm -hmm. This is an area of improvement for me. And I'm going to now do the work to break the generational curse. Mm. That takes a certain level of self-awareness though. Um, Absolutely. And humility, right? Um, humility, yep. So is, here's the thing. More than ever before, um, we're getting divorced. And as, as just a society, as a population, um, where divorce rate is increased exponentially. Majority of divorces are filed by women. Um, part of that is to what you just mentioned, you know, my needs aren't being met. I no longer depend on you fully for my financial needs. So now that I am more self-sufficient when it comes to um, financial assets, I look to you for the emotional support. I look to you for the intimacy. If you're incapable of giving me that, I am going to release you and move elsewhere because I'm better off by myself. Like this is the this is the mindset that the modern woman is now in. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to know how much of it do you think is our responsibility to help our men through their healing journey? Mm, that's such a great question. You know, uh, what's so interesting about you talking about the divorce rates is that research has found that divorce affects men more negatively than men, than women. You know, like the, the rates of suicide and yep. depression are higher in men after divorce than women. So it's yep. just, it's a very interesting paradox, I think, um, uh, with you with you talking about women filing for a divorce. But it is, to your point, again, about just the emotional exhaustion that has happened for a woman at that point. I mm -hmm. think, again, I often reference my mom because she's been such a huge role model for me, good, bad, and in indifferent yeah. uh, in relationships since I was a child. Uh, but, you know, she she really stuck it out with my dad for as mm. long as she possibly could. Yeah. And then it did get to a point of just like the 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 lack of emotion being expressed, the the lack of of you know, just get up and, and do the work just mm -hmm. wasn't there for her. And so mm -hmm. she, she tapped out. Um, but, and I say all that to say, I'm like, now what am I supposed to be answering? <laughs> <laughs> How much of it is our responsibilities as a partner, right? So like, you, you can even use me, for example, say that my husband yeah. wasn't healed, um, but I yeah. really want this marriage to work. Yeah. how long should I stay? What should I do? Um, and how much of it is my responsibility to help in that healing process, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of rhetoric out there. We can go into IG right now and there'll be a meme that says like, it's not your responsibility at all. However, there's healing in love. Yeah. And yeah. part of relationship allows for repair. When someone is right. um, suffering from the voids of their childhood or um, areas that you know weren't fulfilled, you now come into partnership and the things that you didn't get, the, the love that you did not receive as a child in whatever areas that may be, your partner now demonstrates this, you know, this acceptance that you were craving, this, you know, yeah. um, affection that you were craving, whatever those voids are, mm -hmm. they now have an opportunity to fill up some of that love cup. Yeah. Um, but how much of that is our responsibility though? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, so to answer that, I think the first thing we kind of talked about this earlier, every person, whether you're dating or you're married and you're trying to figure out how to navigate the, the trenches, if you will, is you you first got to ask yourself, why do I want this relationship? Mm. Yep. Why do I want to, and I'll use the word so badly, why do I want this relationship to work so badly, mm -hmm. right? Because that could very well reveal some wounds that don't have anything to do with that partner. Mm. But, you know, time, proximity, geographically you know when they came into your life mm -hmm. it, it made sense and it filled it filled that hole right it, yeah. it, it, it spoke to that wound right so I think you got to get really clear about that because without the answer to that or without doing some of the work to unpack that the efforts and the efforting is going to require to make mm. it work yep. you're going to get you're going to get exhausted and depleted pretty quickly if you don't have something to come back to to remind you why you want this relationship to work mm. 
So I think it has to start there. Mm -hmm. But I think I think to your point of of deciding, you'll you'll get that from answering that question, right? You know, it it's got to be more than just the sex is good. (laughs) It's got to be more than just well, we have a baby together. We put in so much time. Right. It's got to be more than time. Something right. It's got to be something so much deeper. There has to be an alignment. Mm-hmm. That 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 partnership, there has to be an alignment for you to really go the long haul, right? And again, you also have to, when we're dating and we're getting to know a person or we're going to marry a person, life is going to reveal whether or not you can argue with this person mm-hmm. and bounce back from it. You're seeing signs of of things very early on, whether or not you you are cognizant or you know you've you've taken the time to be like, oh. That was a thing. Okay. Locking that in. Let mm-hmm. me see if this becomes a pattern now, right? Those instances are always happening, but you, before you can sort of decide if you're going to go the long road and do I want to fight for this? And, mm-hmm. you know, do I stay in there while they go through the healing work that needs to happen? There's some preliminary work that, that you've got to do. And I think, again, that big question of why do I want this? Why do I yeah. want this particular partnership with this person? You've got to get really clear about that. Well, majority of people are going to say, well, because I love him or I believe in him or, you know, he was there for me when, you know, I was in need. So I, I, I'm i a loyal person. You know, I see people through till the end, like they will use whatever, you know, rationalization. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of that is coming from ego, how they see themselves. Like mm-hmm. I see myself as this loyal person. Therefore, mm-hmm. this is how I'm going to demonstrate and prove that. Yeah. And yeah. I also don't want to fail. If I yep. release this person or I let them go for their own healing journey, that will mean mm. that I have to take an L and they take that L as a loss. And I try to teach them to take it as a learning lesson, but they yep. take it as a loss. And so yeah. a part of it is like this attachment to the idea of what could be if, yeah. you know, the other person, you know, does the work, if he, yeah. you know, starts to show up for me, or if he starts to value me, or if he starts, you know, to treat me kindly, you know, this is what could potentially happen. Um, yeah, instead yeah. of what the evidence has been of how they treat you or what, how they show up. Um, do you think Absolutely. that you should ride through that healing process or separate and try to come back? Yeah, I, I think everybody has to decide for themselves what that window is. Mm-hmm. But I, I, don't, I think it's okay. I think that is what uh, makes relationships so beautiful. Like people are going to do things to piss you off. Mm-hmm. People are going to hurt you. Um, we know, unfortunately, infidelity is something that happens in a lot of relationships. Mm, yep. Uh, but I think even with that, because I think that's sort of like the sort of always go back to or go to is, all right, if they cheat, then what? How do mm-hmm. we then sort of bounce back and or restore this? Do I want to restore it? Is that just like a non-negotiable uh, when it comes to divorce? And I think that, again, going back to that original question, you've got to ask yourself, one, like, why, why do I want to make this relationship work? Is it, is it worth it in regards to if I stay with them mm-hmm. while we do the counseling, while we do the repair work? Is, is, do I believe enough mm-hmm. in us and what we have to go the distance of potentially not growing past mm-hmm. this? Maybe, maybe we have sort of tapped out in terms of what we can bring together. You've got to sort of negotiate all of those different variables because there is no sort of like if you do this boom you're repaired you, you fixed it it this life and relationships don't work that way but I think if you can decide you know what all right I've been I've been seeing this this girl now for two years I I think I could give like maybe six months or a year to mm-hmm. see now that now that they've actually gotten into therapy because mm-hmm. we could be at the stage where we're just still talking about <laughs> these healing modalities, right. but you, you're looking for signs that they want to not only, you know, make this thing work for us, but really for themselves. Yep. Because outside of me, do I love you enough outside of this relationship, this pairing to want to see you grow into the healthiest version of yourself? Mm. So mm. It, it's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of intricacies to this thing. And I, that's my biggest thing when I talk to people about relationships is I say, you know, you've got to be open 
beyond this whole black and white narrative mm -hmm. that maybe TV, you know, uh, whatever media is telling you is sort of a two hour or one hour boom. Okay, we, we fixed it over the season of eight episodes. <laughs> right. your, your relationship <laughs> is, is like Grey's Anatomy at this point, right? It's just going to keep going. Season and season and, and going, season. <laughs> season and season, absolutely. Okay, so once again, we're going to role play. I am um, going to use me as an example again. So um, I'm with the partner. He um, definitely has these clear telltale signs that he needs healing, okay? What are some things that I could do to encourage that process? So it doesn't look like, like I'm just storming into the room or just telling them, you know, you need therapy. How do I, you know, do I leave like a pamphlet out? Do I, like, what would you tell for, you know, the audience and people who are listening that really want to help their man, but they don't know how? And they for love sure. them so much and like leaving is not an option. They're like, absolutely not. I'm a ride or dying. You know, right. what, what, what are some tips that you would give? Give us some spicy tips on like yeah. how to encourage our partner. First and foremost, you are, you are the greatest role model in your relationship. Mm. And I mean that on every front. So let's say you've been, maybe you've been in therapy for a decade, mm -hmm. you know, I, I am one who believes if you've been doing that type of healing work for that long, mm -hmm. it, you're going to know very early on whether mm -hmm. or not you can even date this person. Like mm -hmm. you'll, you'll probably know within the first couple of dates, I think, whether or not, because you're already doing the work, right? Yeah. So there isn't this sort of long drawn out process of like, is he the one? I don't know if this changes, then maybe you are, maybe when I tell you, you know the things because mm -hmm. you've been doing the work, you know the things. But let's say maybe healing work is new for you and mm -hmm. you just want to invite them into this space. And so again, taking as much as you feel comfortable with from maybe your therapy, from whatever podcast you listen to that week, whatever insights you gather from that book you've been reading, invite those things into the conversation mm -hmm. in a very non, I'm trying to be your therapist way, <laughs> but I'm just having a conversation about some aha moments, some mm -hmm. revelations that are happening to me and invite them into the conversation in that way. You know, I, there's a TikTok uh, video I did a couple of months back that went viral and the question um, that I, or the, the thought or caption I put was, we ask everything in the beginning of dating, mm -hmm. except for how are you loved? Mm. And that seemed to really resonate with people. And of course, some people was like, oh, I don't, I know my man wouldn't know how to even begin mm -hmm. to answer that question. But my suggestion was figure out the language that works for yep. that partnership, yeah. but you still want to get after the answer to that question. You know, so again, I, I say make it part of the everyday dialogue. Hopefully you guys are already talking yeah. and having some conversations. And the last part I will say is that this may be, this may very well reveal that this isn't the person for you. Mm. And that is a blessing. I think that's what people are scared I know, of. Though. I know immediately, I know, I know immediately that is scary, especially if kids are involved mm -hmm. and families are involved now, we, that terrifies us. But we've got to think about the long term, the long haul of your life, your coexistence with that person. You know, are, are you OK? Just I'm happy. Yeah, we're you know, we're good. Or do you want to lean into being your healthiest and happiest? That's that's to me is should be the goal. Yep. And then yeah. what about when he pushes back? If he pushes back and he's like, I don't need therapy, da, 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 that's for you. Um, yeah. Do you then try to, um, what, start reading a book with him? Do you, um, cause I'm a huge advocate of like workbooks. I'm like, <laughs> what are yeah, some other yeah. options if he's like, no, no, no to therapy? Yeah. I, I think you owe it to yourself to address the discomfort. Mm. And what I mean by addressing the discomfort, say, you know what, this, this conversation is actually really important to me. Like it's mm. really important to me to know how you think about this. Um, but I can see it's it's a little uncomfortable for you. Mm -hmm. Do you mind at least telling me why this is uncomfortable for you? You know, like you're you're yeah. again, you're not trying to become therapists, but you are almost trying to get them to the edge yeah. to want to know for themselves. Well, then why is this uncomfortable for me? Yeah. Like this 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 girl, this guy I've been talking to, I really like them a lot, and everything is good until we get to this intimacy that it's, it's somehow kind of new for me, Yeah. right? So if that is the case, then, oh, this doesn't have anything to do with them. This is me. 
Yep. And again, that could very well reveal, damn, babe, I got some work to do. I don't know if I can do this in sort of an active relationship partnership mm-hmm. way right now. I, I, I got some, some stuff I need to handle just me right now. It may reveal that. And so I think for our listeners, I want you to be open to the possibility of where the, the discomfort could take you when you start having these conversations. Because it's not going to be, and I, I, I want people to get very, very clear when we have these types of conversations, it's it's not going to be Twizzlers and popcorn. Yeah. You know, every it's single com- time. It's not going to be comfortable it's, it's or not. fun all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. I, Absolutely. Think, I think to your point, though, um, in what you mentioned earlier about like asking yourself, why do I want to fight for this relationship so bad? Mm-hmm. I think um, it's also very revealing when you are with someone who is so hurt, who has so much healing work to do, but you want them so badly, right? What is it within you that is attracted to this person and that is choosing this person who has so much healing work to do? What does that say about you? You So I think there's a fear of like it being revealed, like, oh my gosh, there's like more to this than like, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there is, there's actual a psychological phenomenon called the wounded bird syndrome, right? Where you, that could be your story it could be that you I've actually dealt with this myself where you may not be aware of it but you almost attract wounded people Mm -hmm. like there's there's something that you sort of evoke that you know you seem to kind of have it together you seem to be able to emotionally regulate Mm -hmm. and I'm drawn to that like people will be drawn to that aspect of you and it and it becomes sort of this reciprocal thing like you're coming to me for this and I got a little something to offer you baby because I've been doing the work but you don't want that to become the identity of the relationship. Mm. Yes, there are going to be lots of instances of aha moments and revelations that, you know, through your individual work that is going to come front and center and that you, yep. both, you both can sort of relish in. And that's, that's when it gets really good, right? Yeah. But you don't want every day when your spouse or your partner, or your boyfriend or girlfriend comes home from work, that you're having to do this heavy lift yeah. of healing and, and solving problems, Trying emotional to save them. problems for them mm-hmm. every day, right? So mm-hmm. there's a balance, right? There, there is a very healthy balance that you want to get to in those situations. Well, it also goes into like you're pouring, pouring, pouring into them. Who's pouring into you, right? If if your exactly. love cup is overflowing, and now you know, or I even like to you know do a bank account um, example of like you know they're making all these withdrawals, but who's making the deposits? if they haven't done the healing work as well. Right. So right. and it's um, a slippery slope because again, is. while it while it may be sort of alluring in the beginning because you really like this person, you're rooting for them in the relationship. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me get in there and, and and kind of share my healing experience. Sooner or later that's going to probably sort of slip into some resentment. Can you go into um for my ladies because I think that uh we have to deal with this a lot, right? Like what does healing play a role in when it comes to a man's fear of commitment? Why do we see a lot of men who are like, I'm not going to commit. I love you. I want to spend time with you. I want a cupcake with you. Here's your, you know, birthday gift. Here's your Valentine's gift. But I don't want to put a title on this. I don't want to fully commit. They're behaving that way and showing lots of signs, but they won't profess. Where do you you think that healing, you know, issue is coming from? Nine nine times out of 10, it's going to come from some childhood wound. And so if any of your listeners who, who are with us um, for this conversation, if you've never taken an attachment style, the attachment mm-hmm. style quiz, yeah, I implore you to take that. And if you can get your, your partner, whoever you're dating, make it like a little fun date night activity, yep. right? You can still, you know, make a cocktail, you know, have some music playing. It's going to take all of 10 minutes. But I think if you can get one another to do that, it, it's going to open the floodgates. I've mm. never seen a person that I've invited in to take that that doesn't become curious about what that quiz reveals to them. Yeah. Right? So I think that's a great, again, little quick little date night. You know, we haven't, we're coming out of the, the, the pandemic, but we're still doing some yep. stuff at home, right? Make it a date night in. Both parties take the attachment style quiz. And to answer your question, it's going to reveal that for so many men, there's, there's, you know, abandonment issues. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're avoiding attachments because mm-hmm. before someone that you really love and trusted, maybe your dad yeah. hurt you, wanted you in that way. So commitment becomes a very scary thing to a lot of people, not yeah. just men. I know we're talking about men, but it can be a really scary thing 
if you haven't sort of unearthed, mm -hmm. well, why, why do I have an issue with this? Oh, because I've experienced a series of hurtful events yeah. in an area of love and trust. Yeah. Um, and yeah. for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with this, um, Attached is a great book too. If you want to um, find out more about attachment style, you could potentially be um, anxious, avoidant, or um, secure and you know, when it comes to the avoidant, which is kind of like, I think what you were, you know, touching on, if he's avoiding the commitment, if he's avoiding, you know, getting um, too emotionally close to you or um, vulnerable, you know, you will see if we're an anxious person, us trying to like force it, right? Us trying to force like the love down their throat. Like, don't you see what, you know, a good woman I am versus um, releasing that person after you've taken that test and you're like, oh, okay, so you're avoidant. Um, I'm going to be fighting yeah. for this for a very long time. Um, and that will, give you, that will give you the information, Corey saying to like, maybe walk away, have the courage to walk away because like the proof was in the results right? In the, yeah. in the test Cause, results. Because again, the, yeah, because the goal, you just said it, like we, we want to both arrive at a place of secure attachments, yep. right? Where, and I remember I have a really good friend. She's been married for about 10 years now, three kids. Uh, she told me one time, she said, you know, I had an aha moment the other day. She was like, I was finding myself, however my husband felt mm -hmm. that morning when he woke up, like I found myself sort of leaning into that and that taking on that identity. Mm. She was like, I realized I was making my husband a God mm. by giving him that much control over wow. my emotions. And I was like, wow. So she was someone that I invited in to take the attachment style quiz. And a lot of times what you'll see is you may think, oh, I'm, I'm going into this because I've done so much work. I'm secure <laughs> attachment. Everybody thinks that, that may not necessarily <laughs> be the case. You both may have some deficiencies yeah. in the areas of attachment that that quiz will reveal to you. But I think that is such a great jumping off point to whether it's reading the book attached, going to therapy, going to counseling together yep. is going to reveal some really important next steps for you. Oh my gosh. Um, Corey is hitting so much on the money like you always do like so on point i feel like um and i mentioned this before you always post you know so many amazing things that like fill our love cup up when it comes to you know how we handle um uh self-love self-growth relationships um you know things in the media that are going on um what do you think and how do you feel that social media affects the health of our men do you feel like that's something that they need to detach themselves from? Or do you think it's very influential on how they, um, uh, their perspective on relationships? Do you think it's encouraging, yeah. you know, commitment or, you know, the healthy family unit or discouraging? So my, my take on this has always been, even before I became a, a doctor of, of psychology, is that a lot of what's showing up on social media or through social media, meaning the way you handle it, the way you navigate it, um, whether or not it affects your self-esteem, mm -hmm. your, your sense of self-worth, those things were there on some level mm -hmm. before you got to social media. Yep. What that means though is that social media can activate a lot of emotions, mm -hmm. right? That maybe aren't necessarily coming up for you until you get on social media, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yep. So I always encourage people that, if you're really in a place where, you know, every time you go on social media, you're feeling so depleted when you leave, like, oh my God, I hate my body. My skin's awful. Oh my God, my hair mm. is not what I want it to be. Then you need to, one, probably do a detox of social mm -hmm. media. You for sure want to curate your timeline in such a way that those things aren't as triggering to you, right? And I've, I've got friends doing everything. I've got friends who, They've gotten completely off Instagram and they're just using TikTok because they feel like people are just more naturally themselves. They're not yeah. all dolled up. And that just mm -hmm. is comforting to me to not feel that pressure. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that when we, when we talk about men, if a man has an insatiable appetite for other women, mm. social media could go away tomorrow. Mm -hmm between him on his way to the barbershop, being at the mall to get a pair of new kicks, he's going to see attractive women. Yeah. So it's, it's not, I, I really want to encourage people to, to not blame it all on social media. Has social media come in and done some very, you know, disruptive things to yeah. our, our yeah. quality of life? Yes, absolutely. But so many other things do that as well. I think we have to really just call a thing a thing in terms of 
what signs, what patterns of behaviors are there before social media. Yeah. And even if you took social media away, it's probably going to reveal that there's some work to be done in that particular area. So like for the women who are listening and you're like, you know, I just, I feel like my dude is DMing other girls or other girls are, are, are all up in his mm-hmm. DM. If, if you've been privy to that, mm-hmm. whether it was through snooping or maybe, you know, he finally kind of showed you what the conversation, look, look, look at that conversation, right? What, 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 how did he sort of navigate or handle those conversations? Was it just like harding it because they were being sweet and maybe mm-hmm. he's a trainer and that's how he gets clients? <laughs> you know, like you really do have to nowadays sort of like see what this thing is about. Like yeah. if, if, if part of your brand is your sex appeal, then there's going to be some flirting. There's going to yep. be some people sort of pushing boundaries, right? But keyword boundary you're getting into well how does this look because even if I didn't get this little snippet of what's going on on social media when I'm not with them when they're at work or at they're at the mall or they go to the bar with their friends you're getting glimpses in how your person handles the attention of other people how he operates yeah how we operate yep right and if it's revealing that oh you oh, you just have an insatiable appetite for, for other women. This is not going to work. Mm-hmm. That's a blessing then. It's, yeah, it's probably going to sting. It's going to hurt. It may even bring up some things about you questioning your own self-worth. Yeah. But I think that was, that was a, an interview I was listening to recently. And the young lady was talking about how she had done so much to re- make the relationship work. She had mm-hmm. given so much of herself and overextended herself. And she's like, I just can't, can't understand like, how he couldn't see that, how he yeah. couldn't see how I was efforting to make it work. Mm-hmm. And the the psychologist um, or the therapist on the call, she said, but you do know that that had nothing to do with your worth. Yeah. Right? Like that had ab- absolutely everything to do with him. Like you mm-hmm. could have flown to the moon and back yep. for him, yep. but that still doesn't it, uh, impact your own who you are, the value that you're bringing, you're more than enough. You're more than enough. Yep. So I, that's, that's where I stand on the whole social media piece. Why we got to get these men healed. Um, (laughs) Talk to me really quick. I'm out out of curiosity. How do you feel about the Kevin Samuels of the world? What do you, what impact do you feel like he's made on um, men and like the impression that he's leaving or the influence that he's creating? I want to hear your take on, um, image consultants like him yeah I I think that that is a very dangerous um world to operate in when you're giving people advice you know again we everybody has done some level of work hopefully if you're working in a particular profession or field so I'm I'm not here to say that you don't know what you're talking about that's Mm -hmm. not what I mean but I think that what I've seen from Kevin Samuels is he's dealing with a lot of people who, a lot of women Mm -hmm. who do have some deep wounds, Mm -hmm. right? And when you're talking about deep emotional wounds, parental wounds, that really does require the expertise of Mm -hmm. someone that is of a clinical background, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And so I I personally, just on the air of, of coming from the psychologist world, believe that those women that have had those conversations or maybe you've listened to come some of those conversations mm-hmm. and that's really affected you and made you feel some kind of way first of all know that he's not a clinical psychologist <laughs> first of all know that his word is not but bond. also <laughs> right but also he I what I uh, I hate to say this what I've seen because I've, I've only watched clips of him mm-hmm. because it's a lot to to sort of sit with is that he could very well be bringing some things to the surface for some people mm-hmm. that could be an area of work for them. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just, I, I was trained as a psychologist to really look at the positive and the negative and yeah. really weigh it and assess it for what it is. And so I know that that takes a lot of self-awareness to go into a Kevin Samuel conversation and be able to kind of pull out, well, ooh, is there anything that I can sort of make good of this? Yeah. But I think, I think, I think there's something there you know, I don't know if the whole hour or however long he speaks um, is, is worth a, a lot of value. But I think if, if, if something he's saying is activating some emotions to you, like one of the women he's speaking to, if that feels like you in some way, shape mm-hmm. or form, then maybe that's something to lean into to see, hmm, maybe I do have 
some anger management things that I need to work on. Maybe you, that has been. You're yeah. specifically saying this though towards women. What about the influence that he has on men? So I want to know, on do men, you think yeah. it's a positive think it, or negative influence on men? I think it has certainly revealed the thoughts of many men. I think that's why he has the influence that he does. I agree with that. And I think, and I think though that is that is the whole red flag piece, right? Mm -hmm. To to go on these dates and and maybe don't say verbatim what Kevin Samuels was mm -hmm. saying, but if you can sort of sparse out a, an invitation to see how that man thinks about whatever area it is you want some insights on about him, commitment you know, affection, vulnerability, then use that, use mm -hmm. that to your advantage to see where that mind, that man's mindset is. Because mm -hmm. if I'm telling you, if, if they are a clone of, <laughs> of that, of that ideology, you need to, you need to run. Yeah. I definitely you think that he, he's Absolutely. revealed like men who are in alignment with his thought process. And, um, while it may be their truth, doesn't necessarily make it healthy. Um, so I just, yeah, I was just curious on, you know, when we have, you know, these people who are given a platform to speak on relationship, but they don't have expertise yeah. in it. Um, they're just, you know, given a mic and, right. you know, they could potentially be damaging um, us repairing, you know, the family unit or, you know, repairing right. relationship and love. Um, so right. you got to, you got to take some of it as entertainment and with the grain of salt. I was going to say entertainment. And then also like he going back to the attachment styles we talked about earlier, Kevin Semp, someone like him often will affirm a wound area mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've been, if you've been avoiding relationships, Hey, Kevin Samuels gives you a laundry list of why, you know, you might be yeah. avoiding a man might be avoiding a relationship. So he's affirming to them. Oh yeah. That's why she's got to look this certain way, or she's got to present this certain way, or she's got to, you know, he's affirming those things for those men and again you're looking to be like mm, yeah that doesn't align to me that doesn't and, align to my idea of partnership and healthy relationship out of your out of I mean, once again curiosity um do you think that there's healing work that needs to be done have you by listening to the things that you've listened with him what mm -hmm. would you say some of this healing work is that he needs oh that's a good <laughs> that's a really good one um, I, again, I would say there's some type of childhood wound. Mm. There's something that happened, mom, dad, parent, guardian, whoever raised him, um, probably started there. And then some relationship, I'm not even going to say that it was a romantic relationship, mm. some relationship that he was intimately involved in, he got really hurt. Mm. And I think that there's a part of him that's still stuck in that hurt. Uh, and he's now framed he now has framed his hurt in such a way to be a business and I think that the evidence of that is you're doing more hurt than you are mm. good you can't tell me that people are walking away particularly women are walking away from these conversations feeling joy yeah replenished it, revived, like, replenished yeah. and thrive no and I think you know the men who subscribe to his ideology his way of thinking they're 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 laughing they're slapping their knee they might be sending it to their boy mm -hmm. having a good time mm -hmm. but how much actual healing growth work is taking place I don't know if I'm seeing that mm. oh my gosh I know, I know I put you on the spot maybe you you know <laughs> Talk about another <laughs> that was figure. a great one. That was a great one. <laughs> but yeah. I'm just saying, like, you know, media is a huge influence on, you know, how we um, educate ourselves, how we absorb information, especially for people who are not going into, you know, actually see an actual therapist or, you know, a relationship coach or a counseling. If they're not doing that actual work and they're only consuming media or listening to, right. you know, YouTube or podcasts they are, you know, left to figure it out for themselves and dissect and process the information that's being put out there. And it's left up to interpretation. And if they don't have the foundation um, and the professional support, right, we don't know how they're taking it and how they're using that. Right. So and I I'll say, uh, and on to piggyback on that, you know, I think for anybody who's never gotten into any therapy or counseling work, you should know that the way Kevin Samuelson does his work mm -hmm. He's, he's subscribing or prescribing an, anecdotes, right, to, to how to sort of correct and, and get the type of relationship you, you want or, you know, tell you what's wrong with you, right? 
real therapy work is really you doing more of the talking, mm. right? Not not your therapist talking at you, mm. right? And obviously they're guiding you, they're giving you some better processes and some frameworks. Mm -hmm. But I think I want people to get really clear that that is not therapy. Oh yeah, that is that not. Is, that is the <laughs> furthest. <laughs> that is the furthest thing from therapy. So I just I really want people to to be aware of that if you've never done that level of, of healing. And work. by image uh, consultant, he is a stylist. Um, so <laughs> he's telling right. you like how to fix your outfits, how to fix your hair. Um, that's what you're taking relationship advice from if you're listening yeah. to him. So hopefully it's right. for pure entertainment um, and you actually yeah. do the work. You go and seek the professional help that you need, especially our men, right? If certain yeah. toxic traits or certain toxic advice is resonating with them, there definitely needs to be some healing work um, yeah. that needs to be done. So right. I highly encourage this. Um, I love this conversation with you, Corey. I know you're a busy man. And I have to let you go, but I need you to let everybody know that if they're ready to do the work, where they can find you, where they can devour you and eat more up of what you have to offer. Absolutely. So just for general thoughts, uh, insights on human behavior, um, you can follow me at Corey Emanuel. You can find me there, Twitter, Instagram, um, for uh, conversation specific to men and masculinity. Um, please follow us at Men Talking Shift. That's S, S H I F T, Men Talking Shift. And then, of course, I'm on TikTok at the official Corey Emanuel. I love it. I love it. And you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my IG at Spicy Mari. Um, go to the spicylife.com, schedule a free consultation. You can also click and subscribe to uh, the Spicy Life podcast and share it with a friend. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.